So hello everybody again. Thank you for joining us. I'm Tracy Adams from 10 to 2 and I'll be your host for this evening and I'm delighted to be joined by my lovely colleague Jo who's a fellow director here and she'll be taking us through the presentation. Um, just a little bit about us. If you don't know who we are and you're joining us for the first time, 10 to 2 are experts in part-time and flexible recruitment. So if you are looking for a part-time or flexible role, make sure you're registered with us uh, via our website. So a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we've got 30 minutes for the presentation and we'll leave around 10 minutes for Q&A, although we might sometimes eat into that with the presentation. We'll see how we go. Um, there's a Q&A box at the bottom. It's confidential, so only I can see this and Joe can see this. So please feel free to ask questions. Um, as we're going through, I'll try and answer them if I can. If not, there's 10 minutes at the end and we can try and cover them then if Joe hasn't covered them already. And we will also follow up tomorrow with a comprehensive list of Q&As. So it will be in there if we haven't managed to do it this evening. Um, we're recording this. So you don't need to scribble down loads of notes. As I said, just sit back and enjoy. And um, yeah, and without further ado, I think I'm going to hand over to Joe so we can get on with our 30 minutes of content. Over to you, Joe. Thank you, Tracy. Good evening, everybody. Um, as Tracy introduced, I'm Joe Gregory, one of the directors with 10 to 2. Uh, we're delighted to have so many of you join us this evening. Um, this evening's presentation is I think a, a really useful one for people who maybe haven't looked for a job for a while, maybe you've been in your existing job for a long time, maybe you're coming back to the job market after a break. Um, it's really going back to the practicals around job hunting. Um, and this isn't just job hunting through 10 to 2. This is a look at the market in general, a look at your routes to jobs in general, um, and general sort of hints and tips as to what you should be doing and considering in your job search. Um, it is quite a broad topic, so we have kept it relatively high level. If any of you need to answer, ask questions, as Tracy said, there's a Q&A box. You could follow up with us separately if you want or need to. Anyone um, who answers the phone at 10 to 2 will be able to help you um, and give you guidance. But for tonight... I will make a start. So our agenda, um, as I said, it's relatively top level, but we're going to go into a few different areas. So first, we're going to touch on the market. Um, it's been crazy, but we can go into that in a minute. Um, find uh, Job finding channels. So again, if you've not looked for a job for a while, you might not even know where to go or where to start. So we'll cover the different channels that are available to you. Um, the processes, often it's a mystery what the process is behind the scenes um, when you're applying for a job. You know, what, what are the employers doing with your details? What are they doing to find candidates? What, what goes on? Um, so we're going to take you through a very, very basic standard process for the hirer and also for you so that you can see how the two kind of marry up. Um, we'll then have a quick summary of what we've talked about. And then, as Tracy said, we should have time for any questions that you might have. So some stats. Um, anyone who's been looking for a job for a while now will know that the market has not been very easy um, so far this year. Um, a couple of stats to bring to your attention just to demonstrate that. Uh, from March until May 2024, uh, the number of job vacancies was 904,000, which sounds like a lot, um, but it's actually 12,000 de uh, 12, decrease on the previous quarter. So there were actually less jobs available in that period of time than there had been previously. Um, in a similar time frame, slightly before, uh, January to March 24, the number of unemployed people per vacancy was 1.6, which was up from the previous quarter, but it was 1.4. So not only were there less jobs available, but there were also more people going for those jobs. So it has been a tricky market. Um, we have felt it anecdotally. Um, we know that some of our candidates have felt it. Um, and just to give you some hope moving forward, we are now feeling things lightening. There is more action in the market. There's more decision making happening. Um, clients are displaying much more optimism 
Um, so we, we do feel as though things have lifted mm -hmm. and that is starting to be reflected in more stats that are coming out from bodies like the REC who um, oversee recruitment. Um, and hopefully you guys are feeling that too. Hopefully you're seeing more opportunities come into your inbox or through the various channels that you might be looking at um, and your levels of optimism are rising as well. I've just said some of this. So, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, generally the market feels like it's improving. Um, there's still uncertainty in some sectors. Um, there probably always will be uncertainty in some sectors. Um, you will have seen in various press publications that there is a skill shortage in the UK that is still being felt in some sectors and that is still something that needs to be addressed. Um, we still believe that part-time and flexible working is a really great way for employers to address their skills gaps because there are going to be skills out there in amongst um, candidates who only want to work flexibly or part-time that they may not be able to achieve in the more general market. So hopefully you feel as though you're in the right place. Uh, to put your skills to work. Um, shortages of candidates by various sector. The IT sector is a very, very tricky place to be at the moment. There's a real skills shortage in the UK. Um, pandemic brought us many things. One of the things that it brought was a very uh, fast-tracked understanding of employers that work can be acceptable more flexibly. Um, yes, there's been a bit of a rhetoric about the return to work, but generally flexible working is more widely understood and more widely accepted than it ever has been before. Um, so terms like hybrid working, um, working from home, remote working, all of those are much more accepted um, within a job search than they ever have been previously. And I know Again, hearing candidates speak to us about the conversations they've had directly with employers, there does seem to be a more open-minded approach to part-time as well as flexible. However, one thing that everybody's also noticing is the gap between what employers expect and what candidates want widening. Um, that might be a candidate wanting to work entirely remotely and an employer wanting them to be predominantly office based. Um, there almost always has been a gap between what employers are offering salary wise and what candidates would like to be able to achieve. Um, it might be a certain benefits package, but that gap, although it's always been there to some degree, that is widening with the increase of flexible options. Um, and it's something that candidates really need to be aware of as well, because they need to go into their search with a realistic idea of what they're going to be able to achieve. We at 10 to 2 like to be very transparent with what our, what our clients are able to offer. Hopefully you'll see that in our job advertisements and you'll feel that when we discuss roles with you. Um, it's not always the case with all adverts, but most of the time there will be clear parameters around what companies are able to offer um, and I think that doing some research and having a look at what seems to be acceptable within your discipline or within your particular sector is a good way to start managing your own expectations as to what you think you should be able to achieve. Um, so yeah generally the tip is to try and be as flexible as possible. Yes you're going to have some absolute non-negotiables, there are going to be some things in your life that your job absolutely has to provide you, whether that is the time that you're working, whether that is the location within which you're working. But outside of those kind of core essentials, do try and be as flexible as possible because things will never stay static. Once you're in with a, an organisation, you may well be able to negotiate in a better way than you would be able to through the recruitment process. Um, there are other elements that you could take into consideration. So, routes to finding a job. This is where I wish we had some sort of poll in this um, in this chat. Maybe we'll put one in for the next, next time. time. Next time, Joe. Um, yeah. I'm sure there's a number of you out there who haven't looked for a job in a while. Um, so you can tell Tracy in the Q and A if you want to. Um, so just to give you an outline of the different routes that there are, because everybody has a preference as to how they job search. Um, and every business has a preference as to how they advertise their jobs. So you need to be aware of all of the different places that you could and potentially should be looking. 
Now we've split this into formal and informal. Um, and as you can see, there's already six different headings there. So it can be a little bit of a minefield and often there are gonna be duplications throughout these headings as well. So the first thing to say is that you do need to treat your job search like a project. You do need to have some structure and some organization around it and really do some thinking about how you're going to track the applications that you've made, how you're gonna stay on top of the various lines of communication that you're gonna have going. Um, it's very normal to have more than one process running at a time. But again, that does mean that you need to be organized and you need to remember what stage you're at, what conversations you've had, what the terms are involved in each of the different roles that you're going for. Um, this can be a lot, especially if you're already working or you've got a young family to care for or you're you know, otherwise engaged in whatever it is that, that you're doing. So we'd very much recommend using a system that works for you, whether that's a notebook. Um, I love a bit of stationery. So although I think it's closed now, I was always down at Paper Chase getting nice, pretty notepads for things. Um, so whether it's a notebook, whether it's a, an Excel spreadsheet, whatever you find works best for you, treat it as though you would treat a project. So we'll go into some of the different routes. Um, agencies first, because that's us. Um, there are a lot of different agencies out there. Um, we haven't all got the best names. You know, some people refer to us in very derogatory terms, um, but agencies are an incredibly useful source when you are looking for a job. Um, there are all sorts of agencies out there mm -hmm. and they can help you be really focused and really thorough in your job search. Um, they're different from a job board. Um, a job board just advertises a role and agency will go through a screening process with you as well. So you'll meet a representative from an agency. It might be over the phone, it might be via video, it might be in person. Um, agencies are effectively a go-between between, between the candidate and the client. And the majority of the time are representing both their sets of interests equally. They want to make the best match possible. Um, they can be specific to your sector or location. So they may be really useful fonts of information when it comes to particular employers, if you're looking in a particular geographical location, or if you're looking for an employer within a specific sector. Um, they can also offer guidance and coaching. So whether that might be guidance around your CV, um, your interview skills, the way that you're managing your job hunt, there's all different sorts of things that agencies can add value with in your job hunt. Um, they will also be able to give you a huge amount of insight into the employer themselves. So rather than a, a job site where you might just see an advert in black and white, when you've had the chance to speak to an agency, they have often spoken at length to the employer and can give you a good understanding as to the culture, the types of characters, um, who the hiring manager is and what they're like, so on and so forth. <clears throat> um, and in a world of technology, it's quite nice to know that with most agencies, a real person is gonna be looking at your CV. That's not always the case. Obviously there are some large agencies that will employ various different types of software. But a lot of the time, agencies are relatively small and it will be an, an, an individual, a human, looking at your details. Got to get a plug-in for 10 to 2 as well. So obviously, 10 to 2 are an agency. Um, and we've all been there and done it. You know, we've all been through the process of looking for jobs. We've actually all been through the process of looking for part-time and flexible jobs. So we like to think that we can bring a level of empathy as well as all of those great things that we've just talked about agencies in general. So we mentioned job boards before. Now job boards, there are so many of them. I couldn't even list the number of job boards that there are, but there's a few listed there. Total Jobs, Read, Indeed, CV Library, Glassdoor, um, and the Job Centre. Now job boards are great because they are going to have a huge number of opportunities. They will have really clever technology that will allow you to search, to filter, um, to have different CVs that you use for different applications you'll see a whole host of different opportunities there. Um, it's worth spending some time on the job sites and really understanding how they work. Um, it's also worth making sure that you're really paying attention to the job ads that are listed, making sure you understand whether it's the employer listing the role themselves, whether it's an agency listing on behalf of an employer, 
because all of them are going to have different types of responses and you're going to be going into a slightly different selection process. Um, you might not get the depth of information that you'd like from the job advert. Most of the time they're very comprehensive, but there might be intricate details that you would like to know that are going to be missing. Um, and you also might not have any contact details that you can follow up on because a lot of these portals are automated specifically actually to, to give the advertising people a barrier between you and them so that they can just get the information that they want from you first. <clears throat> And that would be your CV most of the time. Um, there are specialist job boards. So the ones we've just gone through are very generic. There are also specialist job boards that you can find by location and by discipline. I won't go through all of those because there are going to be so many disciplines that we could talk about. But if your discipline is quite specialist, then it might be worth looking on a specialist job board. Um, LinkedIn acts as a job board itself. If you have a LinkedIn profile, that can be a very, very powerful job search tool. Um, obviously, you need to make sure that your profile is up to date um, and is as professional as it possibly can be, because that is probably one of the first places that anyone who advertises on LinkedIn is going to look at you. Um, Google Jobs is relatively new. So if you haven't looked for a job in a while, Google Jobs will be something quite new to you. Um, they are an aggregator and they're based on search terms. So you can go in and use your search terms and they will pull jobs from a number of these other places. So it's almost like um, a one-stop shop across a number of different job boards. All of these are great. They can be a little bit overwhelming sometimes. So again, you know, if you're going to make applications directly through job boards, which we encourage, um, you just need to make sure you're staying organized. Um, some of the job boards will have their own way of organizing your applications. So you'll have an account with them and they'll keep a track of which organize, which applications you've made and what stage you're at with that application if you've continued to communicate through their portal. Um, but obviously, sometimes an agency might pick up the phone to you. So I would encourage, again, using that little notebook or using your Excel spreadsheet just to track the applications whether they've come off of that particular portal and started a, another line of communication, where you're at with those communications, all of those sorts of things so that you just don't lose track and become overwhelmed. Um, and another tip there is that you can set up alerts. So a lot of these um, job boards have clever technology, as we said, where you can pop your search terms in and it will alert you if any new jobs become available that match your criteria. So it can do some of the searching for you, which is always helpful. Online Direct. Now, this is a little bit more of a targeted approach. Um, if you are very keen to work for a particular employer or if you are very keen to work for a few different employers within a particular sector, you can use their website directly. Most employers will advertise vacancies on their own website because it's a nice, easy, free way for them to try and engage with candidates. Um, this is much more targeted. You do need to be much more proactive with this approach. Um, and again, you know, you, you need to make sure you're reading the advert carefully and responding in the way that they would like you to respond. Um, often, if a company advertises a number of roles through their own website, they will have a portal that they're then taking you through to. It's another account that you'll need to set up. It's another password that you'll need to remember. So again, we come back to the point of staying organized, making sure that you're keeping your notes um, somewhere where you can stay on top of everything. Um, it is very useful, as we said, if you know exactly who you want to work for, or, or if you're very keen on a particular sector and a particular number of players within that sector. Um, you know that you're speaking directly to the employer themselves. There's no question whether you're going through an agency. There are questions, however, about whether your details are being seen by a human, because a lot of the portals that they use will have um, elements of AI reading your CV on their behalf. Um, but hopefully you will be able to sort some contact details and follow up on things directly rather than relying on the portal for all of your communication. Headhunting. So this is less common, but it still does happen. Um, there are specialist headhunting agencies, um, businesses headhunt themselves, uh, and some more general recruitment agencies will have a headhunting function available. Um, 
this is where you just kind of sit back and, and don't really have to do very much. If your details are registered with um, some job sites, that's definitely helpful. If you have um, that lovely little open to work um, logo on your LinkedIn, that's definitely helpful. If you are seen to be active in communications with employers um, and with agencies who know you are available and know you are keen for work, that is helpful. Um, so you can make sure that you are making the relevant people aware that you're interested and open for communication. Outside of that, headhunting is really driven by the employers themselves or by the agencies themselves, um, but they need to be able to find you. So making sure that you're registered with the relevant places, making sure that your LinkedIn profile is up to date are all really good steps to take so that headhunters can find you um, and know that you're open for a discussion. So there's slightly less common or less formal, I guess, ways of um, applying for jobs. So offline direct. Um, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but when I was younger, I printed out my CV and took it to some places that I'd like to work. Um, this approach can still work. And actually, we've had anecdotal stories of it working relatively recently. Um, so there is still the opportunity to have a slightly more offline, slightly more direct approach. It might not be that you print your CV off any, anymore. It might be that you find the details of the HR manager for the business that you're quite keen to work for and make a speculative approach. Um, granted, that's kind of online. But um, with this, you need to be quite bold. You need to make sure that you have a really tailored cover letter expressing your interest in that specific company. Um, there is nothing worse than receiving an application where it says, dear sirs, I'd like to apply for dot, dot, dot. And it's not the role that you're advertising at that time or it's a different company name. So you need to apply an extra level of care and attention when it comes to the cover letter that you're putting together. Um, you obviously need to be prepared to get a phone call in response. So again, keeping track of the fact that you've applied to these places, even if it's speculatively, making sure you know who you've given your details to and who you've expressed an interest to. Um, I guess a good point to make at this stage also is if you are giving your mobile number out to people, either make sure you're available to answer your phone or at least make sure that you've got a voicemail that recognises that it's your number um, it's quite difficult when you phone a number and there either isn't a voicemail available or it's a generic pre-recorded, this is GIFGAF, please leave a message. Um, so most phone companies will allow you to leave a personalised message, uh, which makes it much more helpful for people to know they've got through to the right number. Um, or at the very least, make sure it is a pre-recorded message that says your number, you know, you have reached seven blah 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 um especially if you're giving your details to direct employers because they will want to be able to know that they're reaching you and your own contacts um i think that this is massively massively underrated way of looking for a job um and it does take some confidence to be able to have a conversation with people and say I'm out looking for a job at the moment. Please do let me know if you hear of anything. But it amazes me. It really does amaze me how many times we hear um, that somebody found an opportunity through someone they met at the school gate or somebody they met at nursery drop off or somebody that they met while visiting their aunt or whatever it might be. Um, Utilising your contacts and making sure that they're aware that you are actively looking for a role can be an incredibly powerful way to search for a job. Um, it might not be that it comes back tomorrow. It might not be that every person you speak to is able to help you. Um, but if you are confident enough to share with people that you are actively looking for something, then it can be a really great way of bringing opportunities onto your radar that you might not have otherwise known about. Um, sometimes these opportunities can be ones that haven't yet been advertised elsewhere. Sometimes they can be ones that won't get advertised because it might be the employers just dipping their toe in the water and having a think about maybe recruiting this type of person. And if you can get in there nice and early, we shouldn't be saying this, should we? It's doing us out of fees. <laughs> um, but genuinely, it is 
a really, really effective way of looking for a job. So keep your eye on your network. If there is somebody in your network or somebody um, in your, your wider group um, who you know works for a company that you're interested in or you know has contacts within a sector that you're interested in, then be brave and have the conversation. Obviously, there's politics at play sometimes if you're in a job at the moment, but most of the time people can be trusted if you ask them to keep it quiet. So we mentioned at the start that the hiring process can be a bit of a mystery when you've not been involved in it. So if you haven't worked in an HR department or in recruitment or as a hiring manager, you you might not necessarily know um, what process employer goes through. Um, and it can be really frustrating being a candidate, not knowing what's going on behind the scenes and not knowing why people haven't got back to you. So we thought we'd take you through a, a very, very generic process that a hirer might stick to in order to uh, bring on board a new employee. So first of all, they'd identify a need. Um, that need can come up for a number of reasons. Maybe somebody is resigned and there's therefore the need to replace that individual. Maybe the company's grown and they've identified um, a need for additional employees because of that growth. There's all different sorts of reasons that that need can be identified. And there's all different sorts of timeframes that it can take as well to really not just identify a general need, but to be able to consolidate that into a realistic role. Um, from that, obviously, a job description needs to be created. Um, that can sometimes be as simple as replacing a like-for-like -like role. You know, it might be that the job description already exists, but sometimes they'll need to go back to the drawing board and, and go from scratch, create something completely new. Um, that job description will then need to be uh, reimagined into a job advert um, because there is a difference. Um, and that job advert might look differently on different channels. So the employer will need to go through a process of deciding what channels they want to use. And that can depend on so many different factors, um, the cost, the reach that they need to have, the discipline that the role's in, the speed at which they need to recruit, goes on and on and on. Um, once they've decided they need to be able to share that information. So as I said, that job description will need to be manipulated into many different forms, depending on what channel they decide to follow. Um, if they go through an agency, they'll need to have relevant meetings with that agency to fully brief that agency. Same with a headhunter. Um, they will need to have conversations about what those channels mean for them internally. You know, if they're going to use a job board, who's going to be responsible for receiving the applications? Who's going to filter them? Who's going to go through first interviews? Um, once they've got the job out there, they need to then receive the apps. Um, and as you'll have identified from the stats we went through at the beginning of tonight's presentation, those apps can sometimes be uh, in large numbers. Um, there are a lot of people looking for less jobs than uh, are needed. So sometimes there will be a huge number of applications coming through um, and it will need to be somebody's responsibility to shortlist those. Again, that might go through an a shortlisting process with an agency so there might be um, an engagement phase through that agency and you might be involved in that engagement phase um, most of the time the shortlisting will happen without you being aware of it because it will be shortlisting based on the information that you've provided especially if it's a direct application um, to an employer they then invite people for interviews we're not going to go into the interview process and how many different stages they might be because it varies so drastically from employer to employer and from role to role. Um, some employers will have a single stage interview process where you will meet with them once and they will then make a decision about who they want to employ. Some employers will have a, a five stage interview process where you'll meet with a number of different stakeholders and you might have some interviews on a remote basis and some interviews where you go into the office. There is no right or wrong, and there is no norm in that. Um, one of the benefits, again, of coming through an agency is that we can support, or agencies can support and guide you through that process and hopefully give you some insight as to what the recruitment process is likely to look like from the beginning. So you can manage your expectations and your timeframes and availability around that. Um, there is nothing wrong with asking the employer what the process is due to look like 
um, right at the beginning so that you can again get that upfront understanding. Um, it means that you can also think about at what stage in the conversation do you ask certain questions or have certain conversations because you'll understand what their process is likely to be. <clears throat> um, hopefully, if you get through their interview process, however long or short that might be, you'll get to the point where they will make you an offer. Um, at that stage, more so now than ever before, there is negotiation available. Um, again, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but when I first started in recruitment, it was like you'd get an offer, they'd accept, you'd start, that was it. Um, I don't think we ever have an offer just accepted without some sort of negotiation now, um, whether that is around the salary, the benefits, the start date, um, or even if there's no negotiation, there's often a period where a candidate will want to have a think about it. And again, we would encourage candidates to make sure that they are seriously considering the detail involved in an offer before accepting, especially when you're considering flexible working or part time working in addition to all of the standard elements of an offer. Um, again, agencies can help with this. They're often very well versed in what the client or the employer will and won't negotiate on. So we'll be able to add value through helping you decide which areas to negotiate on, if any at all. From there, you'll obviously start with the business. Now, the one thing we haven't spoken about is which points you're going to be communicated with and which points you aren't, because we're not able to guarantee what that will look like. Um, through an agency, you are likely to be communicated with more um, because it's it's another person involved in the process who has your best interests at heart and we will be able to update you on the different stages. Some direct employers are incredibly good at communicating throughout their recruitment processes. They really understand that it's important for the, for the candidates to know what's going on behind the scenes, when they're likely to hear, so on and so forth. Some aren't necessarily so good and it may be no fault of their own. Maybe they don't have the manpower available to be able to communicate that thoroughly. Maybe they just don't know at that stage what it is that they're meant to be communicating or haven't made the relevant decisions internally to be able to communicate anything that meaningful. Um, but this is normally what's happening in the background. And hopefully if you apply this kind of thought process to the processes that you're going through, um, you'll be able to have a, an educated guess as to where you are in that process um, and know at which points it's relevant or even meaningful to be getting in touch and maybe chasing up some some input and some feedback just a few more minutes joe it's nearly 25 to oh sorry i'll talk faster um so your your process will mirror the um employer's process as with the employer you need to allocate time to this we talked about it at the beginning you need to treat it like a project um you need to make sure that you are giving these applications time and attention we often talk to people about tailoring their CVs and they'll look at us aghast saying, I've just written this thing. I don't want to have to tailor it. Um, and yes, it does take time, but tailoring your CV is one of the most powerful things that you can do to help your successful job search. Um, so really allocating some time to, to making your job search successful. It could be 20 minutes a day. It could be one afternoon a week, whatever works for you. Set the criteria. Again, make sure you know what your um, non-negotiables are and what your areas of negotiation are. Negotiation are. Um, if you know the sector that you're aiming for, if you know the, the exact discipline or the exact level that you're looking for, set those core criteria. Um, make sure that you understand the titles. Titles change over time. What used to be personnel, again, I'm not telling you how old I am, what used to be personnel now isn't even HR anymore, it's people and culture or, you know, so make sure that you understand what the current titles are for your discipline and for your sector. Um, create a base CV and cover letter. We've just talked about this. Make sure you have your core document that you can then tailor for each and every application. Register with agencies and job sites, going through that process, making sure that you're registered, making sure your details are out there, making sure you're visible, really, really important. Um, you then get some of that work done for you if you set up those searches, if you make sure that you make friends with the agents, they're out there doing some of your job for you. Um, tailoring your CV, we've just talked about updating LinkedIn, make sure that your LinkedIn is buzzing. We do have a separate um, webinar on LinkedIn, which I'm sure that we'll send you links to tomorrow. Um, it's very, very useful. LinkedIn can be a scary place if you've not looked for a job in a while. 
once you get the hang of it, it's a really lovely place, actually. It's kind of like social media for your job. Um, and reach out, you know, once you feel confident, once you've got all of this, and I promise you, going through this process will make you feel more confident about reaching out, knowing that you've got your CV there and ready, knowing that you know what your non-negotiables are, will give you that extra level of confidence to speak with people. And then keep track and follow up, you know, use your notebook, use your Excel spreadsheet, use that time that you've allocated to say, right, who haven't I heard from in a while? Where am I with that process? Have a little tick list of how often you're going to chase and who you're going to chase. Um, and try to be patient, try to be kind, try to be positive. Everybody's trying to help you, <laughs> um, even though it doesn't feel like it most of the time or some of the time. Um and you know the you will get there yeah so yeah. very quick summary because i know we're running out of time so treat it like a project <laughs> be patient and positive spread the word and try and make it easier on yourself by doing that work up front you know because once you're out there in the process sometimes it can it can run away without you sometimes all of these different applications can be emailing you and calling you so doing that upfront work will make it easier for you in the long run fast enough yeah perfect <laughs> is that it you're done yeah well done well done so i've been answering lots of questions while you've been going so hopefully that will answer some people's questions and all of these we'll try and cover in the q a tomorrow anyway however let's try and cover a couple now that we haven't managed to get around to on the chat so someone's asked um uh how do you account for working within the family business on the cv is it best to mention on the cv dur and during the interview although it's going to be obvious my quick answer to that would be you should treat your time at your family business in exactly the same way as you would any other job what you're doing is valuable relevant as long as you include your functions your responsibilities your achievements particularly your achievements Yes, it'll be obvious. You can't hide the fact that you're working for family business if your name is the same. So that's, I think, hopefully a quick answer for that one. So, um, Joe, what about this one? This is quite interesting. Companies, culture is really important to me. How can I find out about the culture of a company before taking on a job? So important um, yeah. and is, is probably now more important than it ever has been historically. Um, there's a number of different ways that you can go about finding out about the company's culture. You can do your own independent research. So um, the website will give you clues. The company's website will give you clues to, as to their culture. Um, maybe yeah. some employees have got LinkedIn pages. You can do a little bit of stalking around, find yeah. out who's working there, what yeah. their backgrounds are. Yeah. Um, ask the question at the interview, whether yeah. it's with the agency or whether it's with the employer directly. Absolutely. Ask the question. Um, yeah. most employers will be used to being asked that question now and they should be able to respond comprehensively. Yeah. Um, if they haven't thought about what their culture is, then that's a big telltale sign as well. You know, they they should know what their company culture is and, yeah. and what company values are even taking it that next step further. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, this is a quick one because you sort of touched on it. What are your thoughts on using the open to work feature on LinkedIn? I think go for it. Definitely use it because we as recruiters look for the words open to work and we look for that badge, particularly if we're seeking people out as well. Absolutely. absolutely. I mean, obviously, you need to feel comfortable with yeah. having there. Yeah. You know, if, if you're currently in a job, yeah. don't put it up. <laughs> don't um <laughs> you don't want to know obviously don't put it up yes yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um but if you are footloose and fancy free and you're actively looking for something then it is a a really really useful yeah. tool um for businesses headhunters and agencies who are proactively looking for people and on the flip side to that, one that we don't really talk about, but we should, is the I'm hiring badge, which is in the same format, but it's purple. So if you there are companies that you like the look of, there are people at those companies that you come across on LinkedIn when you're doing your research for companies you like the look of. If someone's got that purple badge, it's really quick in your face. They are hiring. So that's really helpful as well from that, that point of view. Absolutely. Um, and again, it's it's getting your details out there. You know, it's not being afraid to click on that, you know, message yeah. them and get your yeah. information yeah. across if they've got that little hiring thing worst case scenario they're going to redirect you back to the website and ask you to fill out a form but you know you will have made an impression by getting in touch with them directly um yeah 
I'm not allowed to talk more, am I? <laughs> no, no, that's fine. That's fine. I think absolutely. Um, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm not going to answer this one in full, but I think we'll send you some information. We've got loads of info on this. So any particular su suggestions for someone returning to work after a career break? This came up quite a lot in the chat. This is a big area. And Joe earlier in the year did a whole series of returners, um webinars and we've also yep. got one called mind the gap so we can point you to all of this info and these resources in the q a's tomorrow and if ever in doubt go and find our youtube channel 10 to 2 we've got umpteen videos on there which are recordings of previous webinars so you might be able to go and see something in there but we'll include some links tomorrow because it's a big subject lots of hints it's, tips. it is a big subject and it's really daunting you know yeah. we we speak with people every single day who are re-entering the workforce after a break for one reason or another um and we really feel for for you guys because it yeah. is super scary but we're here for you you know not only are our resources there but if you need to pick up the phone and have a conversation with somebody then you know please do reach out because we are experts in the field that you're looking for and we've there's, there's very few things we haven't heard before. So yeah. we're genuinely here to help. Yep. And, the, like, and there's been more coming in, more questions coming in. So we're going to have to stop because we always say it's 40 minutes, but we will use these questions tomorrow. And if it's not something I'll put in the q and I will email you specifically with an answer or pick up the phone and give you a call. So we'll make sure you get an answer. So I think I'm afraid that is all we have got time for tonight. Um, let's draw things to a close. And thank you for joining us all, so many of you. And thank you to Joe for all of that insights and information. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to say good night now, but we will follow up tomorrow. So you'll, that's not the end of us. You'll hear from us tomorrow. <laughs> right? Don't so, get rid of us that easily. No, no, <laughs> so good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for Bye. joining, everyone. Night night. Bye.